Welcome back to In Need of a Refill, where God's Word and the coffee are never in short supply. Thank you for joining us today. Don't forget to like and subscribe so that you don't miss anything that's coming up on In Need of a Refill. If you have a comment or a question or a passage you would like me to look at, leave in the section below. Oh, we'll get to it just as fast as we can. When I was young in Bible class, uh, one Sunday, uh, the teacher passed out this page uh, with like four pictures on it, um, each picturing God a different way. One was like a, a grandfather. One was like, uh, you know, a kid on a skateboard kind of thing. I, I don't remember the other two, but the point behind that was how do we picture God? Well, see, our worldview changes how we view the world around us, how we view our position in the world, and how we view God. If we think we're all high and mighty, then we deserve, this is ours, how dare you insult me, how dare you not give me what I want. If we view ourselves as really low, I can't believe that I can actually achieve this. I can't believe I can do this. You know, this is amazing. Uh, or sometimes not even that good. Um, so the question that we want to pose today is how do we picture ourselves? Because it matters. It matters how we treat one another. It matters how we obey or disobey what our leaders say. It matters how we obey or disobey what God commands us to do and what we choose to obey in Scripture and what we choose to say Nyeh! with. Uh, hopefully we don't say Nyeh! with Scripture, but sometimes our picture of ourselves and our past experiences will affect the way we obey or disobey what God says. Um, so the questions that we need to ask is, how do you picture yourself? And how do you picture God? So today, what we're going to do is take a look at kind of who God is. Um, Dalton has been teaching Job on Sundays and Wednesdays uh, when work has not gotten in his way. And he has done a fabulous, fabulous job. Way to go, Dalton. Keep up the good work, brother. Today, what we're going to do is take a look at Job and kind of see, well, what he thought of himself in a sense and how he got a little bit too big for his britches, as uh, some people would say. So here's how he opens up. In Job chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless, upright, fearing God and turning away from evil. Seven sons and three daughters were born to him. His possessions also were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and very many servants. And that man was on, was the greatest of all the men of the east. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day. And they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When the days of feasting had completed their cycle, Job would send and consecrate them, rising up early in the morning and offering burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, Perhaps my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. Okay, so what we see here is Job was, well, set for life, right? I mean, he had a great number of possessions. He was extremely wealthy for that particular time period. But at the same time, he looks to be like a very godly man. You know, uh, offering sacrifices just in case his sons 
And, well, you could presume also his daughters had done something to offend God. This is amazing. I mean, God calls him later blameless. You know, he says, there's no one that's righteous like him. He's incredible. What you see when you get into chapter 1 and also chapter 2 is a playing out of this cosmic bet of sorts where God and Satan are, um, well, kind of seeing if Job is really as righteous and blameless and upright as God had said, have you considered my servant Job? What we see is, well, God allows Satan, first of all, to take all of his possessions away. And then, second of all, he allows him to hit Job really close to home and cause sores and illness and things like that on his body. Um, here's a list in uh, chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Oxen are stolen. Verses 15 and also 17, servants are killed. Uh, verse 16, sheep and servants are consumed by fire from heaven. Verse 17, camels are stolen. Verses 18 and 19, children are killed in the home uh, as it collapses. And also chapter 2, verse 7, sore boils from head to bottom of his feet. Okay, so basically what you've got here is wealth has been stolen from him. Possessions burned with fire. Co-workers and employees murdered by either raiding bands or by, uh, well, accidents that happen. Death of children. And also a loss of Job's personal health. Okay, so Job goes from the top of the mountain to the bottom real quick, right? So the question is, how does Job respond to all this? Well, at the end of chapter 1, when he loses all his possessions and even all of his children, he responds like this. He said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away me. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Through all this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. This is an incredible way to respond. And if we are ever faced with this kind of sorrow and this kind of challenge in life, hopefully and prayerfully, you and I can respond this way. But notice also in chapter 2, after he loses his health, at the end of the chapter, he, he sits on the ground in dust and ashes, and he does not speak for a week. Okay? You know, he is in deep mourning, and rightly so. So, like all of us, and I almost said many of us, but really all of us have faced this from one time or another. We've wanted to know... God, what's going on? Why is this happening to me? So when you get to chapter 31, Job has already been putting together all his arguments and things like this. And he, well, he's, he said, I'm innocent. I haven't done anything. In chapter 31, verses 35 through 37, here's what he says. Oh, that I had one to hear me. Behold, here is my signature. Let the Almighty answer me and the indictment which my adversary has written. Surely I would carry it on my shoulder. I would bind it to myself like a crown. I would declare to him the number of my steps. Like a prince, I would approach him. So in a sense, I demand an audience with God. Okay? You know, I want to know God. What's going on here? Why is this happening to me? You know, I deserve an answer. 
surely the Lord doesn't understand. I mean, really, what's, I don't get this, and surely he can't understand what's going on here or how I feel. I would remind the Lord of who I am. <laughs> Man, think about that one for a minute. I demand an audience. I want to remind the Lord of who I am. Oh, that we would never be that brash and arrogant. God, I deserve an answer. I am high and mighty. Oh, man. Well, eventually, God does give him an answer, sort of. <laughs> what we're going to do is consider part of that answer. We're going to read uh, Job chapter 38, verses 1 through 11. Let's go ahead and read that together. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now gird up your loins like a man, and I will ask you, and you instruct me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who set its measurements since you know? Or who stretched the line on it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who enclosed the sea with doors when bursting forth it went out from the womb? When I made a cloud its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band and I placed boundaries on it and set a bolt and doors. And I said, thus far you shall come, but no farther. And here your proud waves stop. Now, he goes on to ask Job more questions. And, uh, but basically, Yahweh is saying, who do you think you are? You obviously, obviously don't know who you're talking to. Are you able do you understand? What's wrong with you? Think about this, Job. In essence, Job never actually gets an answer. Yahweh has no uh, requirement to explain himself because he is the Almighty. He is the one who created everything, including Job, including you and me. So let's go ahead and keep reading in Job chapter 42, verses 1 through 6, and see how Job responds after he has been dressed down appropriately by Yahweh. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have declared that which I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear now, and I will speak. I will ask you, and you instruct me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my face sees you. Therefore, I retract, and I repent in dust and ashes. How does Job respond? You are all-powerful. Your plans, they can't be stopped. I clearly did not understand who I was talking to or what I was talking about. Instruct me, please. And I am sorry that I overstepped my bounds and spoke where I should have listened. That's how Job responds, basically. I repent in dust and ashes. You see, Job, when he was confronted by who Yahweh was, who Yahweh is, because Yahweh has not changed, he apologized for his arrogance. He apologized for overstepping. He repented because Yahweh is far, far more powerful and far more wise than you or I 
or he or anyone can even fathom. So as we get ready to close today, I have a few questions for us to consider and hopefully to improve our walk with God. Do we have the illusion that we are in control? Oh man, that, that one's tough, right? Because for type A per personalities, we're control freaks, right? I am in control. You will do as I say because I know the right answer period. And sometimes, yes, we do know the right answer. And sometimes, yes, people need to listen. But ultimately, the one that is in control is God. We need to drop this illusion that we control everything around us. Because, brethren, we don't. Do we fall victim to the illusion that good always comes to those who do good. These struggles that are, they deal with in the book of Job are still dealt with today. The idea that if we do right, God will bless us with material things, that nothing will ever go wrong, that we will lead happy and um, productive lives, that is a farce. That is not true. We are blessed when we obey. But that does not mean that the wallets will be full. That does not mean that bad things will not happen. That does not mean that we will always be successful. This health and wealth gospel is not true. This is an idea that predates the law of Moses, at least, probably predates Abraham. And yet, it's still around today. We need to wake up and see who God is and how he actually loves and treats his people. And how he actually loves and treats those that are on the outside. Because in many cases, well, Jesus said, God causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. In many cases, well, he treats us the same. Now, those on the inside, those that are Christians, do have a future. And we have hope where the outsiders do not unless they repent. But that does not mean that we are on easy street. It just doesn't. Do we treat God as if he owes us something. Now, honestly, we would say, no, never. No, I don't do that. But do we? Verbally, we say no. But by our actions, by the way we carry ourselves, do we actually think God owes us something? God is lucky to have us, right? No. He doesn't owe us anything. He is not lucky to have us on his side. We are blessed that he wants us. We are blessed that we are on his side. Let's not forget that. Do we recognize when we have treated God as common and then respond appropriately? If we are not careful... We treat God like he's the neighbor next door or our best friend. And that means we talk to him however we want. We treat him however we want because we know that that person will forgive us. We know that, well, that person is just like us. Newsflash, folks, that we all need to hear. God is not like us not like us he is so far above us that he needs to be treated as holy as perfect not as common let's do that
us treat God the way he deserves to be treated. He is sovereign. We need to remember that. Thank you for the time together today. I hope and pray you have a blessed week. Don't forget to like and subscribe so that you don't miss anything that's coming up on In Need of a Refill. And remember, if you're ever in need of a refill on God's Word, all we have to do is take it off our shelves and spend time with Him. Thank you for joining us today. Have a blessed week.